Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Vince, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Vince. And I'd like you to know that I'm ashamed of you, Clark, for what you did to that girl. I think it's off. But I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be sober. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to be part of the action in Lubbock this weekend. I'd also like to thank Bud and Alpha, my most gracious host and hostess. They were, they have been most gracious to me, and they have showed me once again that uh, that marvelous hospitality that you have in Texas. It's a tradition when we come to Texas that you treat us so nice, and we appreciate it. And while I'm at it, I would also like to thank Evelyn Coger and Pew for taking my money in the poker game last night. <laughs> also part of a Texas tradition. Every time I come here, I... Although usually it's by, you know, three guys named Slim and Doc with <laughs> straw in their mouth and... Uh, Probably about 2 o'clock on Saturday morning, I'm always hearing things like, well, boy, I hope your talking's better than your poker playing, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. At any rate, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you have my money. I, I hope you put it to good use, Evelyn. And I would like to uh, welcome the people that came up and took these books, the new people. Welcome to the new adventure of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are delighted that you're here. And I can tell you something. I've never met you, but I know a lot about you if you're new. I know that your attitude is poor. (laughs) And your judgment is not all the best. And I know that down deep inside in your heart, you know that you really don't belong here. (laughs) Regardless of what you're telling us. I know that uh, if you are like me, and like most of those that I have known when they're new in AA, you are engaged with a great debate with yourself, and that is, am I really alcoholic? Well, I can help you with that. You are. (laughs) We don't get mistakes here. Let me tell you, the social drinkers in Lubbock are not hanging out here tonight. This isn't where they're at. If you are here, you belong. People who think about coming to Alcoholics Anonymous are alcoholics, who they are. People who don't, who drink socially, they don't say to themselves, geez, I think I'm going to go down and see the folks at AA. See if I can find some quiet heart. Uh, It's not what happens. People who come here have a, you know, you got the heat on is why you're here. Things are bad. Life is not going well. They're all mad at you. They don't want any more to do with you. And if that's the case in your life, I think you're in good shape. You will hear many people in Alcoholics Anonymous that will wish you love. I don't wish you love. I wish you desperation. I hope that you are desperate tonight, because if you are, we tend to get your attention, and you tend to stay here, and if you stay here and you do what we do, amazing things will happen to your life. You will not believe what will happen to you if you stay here and you do what we do, but you have to do both of those things, both of them, not just one. Just staying here means nothing. But staying here and doing what we do means everything. And I hope you understand that. Now, I'd like to start out tonight, especially if you're new. I like to talk to new people. And they, hey, that's, yeah, yeah, maybe it's because I, that's what I am. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I like to talk to new people in AA. And I want to tell you tonight, I'm going to start out and tell you about my first AA meeting. And it was a long time ago now. It was in November of 1965, and it was in Long Beach, California. And it was on a Friday night, and it was in the basement of a Presbyterian church. 
And all of the people there that night looked much like you look tonight. Everybody looked good. Everybody sounded good. They smelled good. Everybody was a tightly wrapped package, normal and ordinary looking. It seemed to me that it was a room full of dentists and insurance salesmen and their wives. <laughs> Nobody looked like an alcoholic. If you walked into that room that night and you had nothing to do with AA and you had nothing to do with the disease of alcoholism and someone said to you, you're in an AA meeting, pick out the alcoholics, you wouldn't have picked any out. You would not have been able to find any, except one, me. You would have picked me out. I, I did stand out. I had on a torn t-shirt and a ripped pair of jeans. I had not shaved or bathed in over a week. And I just spent the previous five days in the Long Beach City Jail due to a series of very unfortunate circumstances that were not my fault. <clears throat> I had been victimized by the fascist police department in Long Beach, California. It was a regular thing with me. And uh, I like to remember, uh, and if you're new, I want you to know that I was in the basement of that Presbyterian church on that Friday night in November of 1965 for one reason and one reason only. It was the only place I knew of where I could sit down and not be arrested. <laughs> I was not there in search of serenity. <laughs> so if you are new or relatively new tonight and you, and you feel as though you don't have the proper motivation to be here, I have very good news for you. We do not grade you on your motivation here. If we did, this would be a much smaller meeting. Let me tell you, and you'd have a different speaker, I'll tell you that. I, uh, I sat in the back, of the back of the room in that meeting, where most new people sit. New people don't sit up front in AA. They're, uh, I guess they're afraid if they don't have it, they might catch it. <laughs> if you sit up front in an AA meeting, it implies commitment. It means that maybe you want this. And I didn't want anybody to think, I didn't want this. I sat, I just didn't have a better idea. And I sat in the back of the room. And I should tell you that I'm Irish and I'm Catholic. And I'm from New Jersey. And I have trouble with people from Texas. <laughs> we just don't, the chemistry's bad. I don't know. We just don't. And I sat next to a guy who was six foot five. And he had on cowboy boots. And a ten gallon hat in his lap. And his name was Tex. <laughs> Now, you should know that Tex was not sober very long himself, but he was at the, he was at the evangelical stage, you know, <laughs> somewhere in the middle of his third month. And Tex, uh, Tex wanted to hep somebody. And he told me, he said, boy, I'm going to hep you. <laughs> and I remember thinking, uh, why don't you go hep somebody else, Tex? You know what I mean? Why don't you give it a rest? But he wasn't having any. He was going to hep me. And the first thing he did was he repeated to me in rapid succession all of the AA cliches, one after another. They're dreary, I'll tell you. If you're new, they are really dreary. They're, you know, if you're here in search of something special, and you have Tex, and he's telling you, easy does it, and live and let live. And I think, you know, I'm thinking, easy does what? Uh, and he finally, he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, I keep it simple. I thought, I'll bet you do, Tex. <laughs> I don't, that's the first thing Tex said that I didn't have any trouble with, I'll tell you that. I, <clears throat> I agreed with him. And he put a handful of pamphlets in my lap. And that's something we're big on here, if you're new. We, we have a lot of pamphlets. We, we have one to cover your case. Regardless of who you are, what you are, and today what your sexual preference is, whoever you are, we have a pamphlet here that will cover your case. And he gave me a handful of pamphlets. And on top of the pamphlets was a card with the 20 questions on it, which uh, they were real big on then. 
uh, the, the folks in the, at the medical school in Johns Hopkins, in their infinite wisdom, have decided how alcoholic you are by the way you answer these 20 questions. Uh, the key to this is the more, the more yes answers you have as you go down this list, the more alcoholic you become as you answer these questions. It's very bad to answer yes if you don't want to be here. And uh, I went down the list, and the questions were rather, uh, I, I, they were redundant. Questions like, uh, is alcohol causing you problems with your job? Not this week. <laughs> <laughs> is alcohol causing you problems in your marriage? Not since the last one divorced me. <laughs> None at all. I answered 19 yes as I went down that list. The key is if you answer one yes, you may be, you may have a drinking problem. If you answer two yes, you do have a drinking problem. If you answer three or more yes, you're alcoholic. I answered 19 yes. I answered no to the question, do you seek lower companions? <laughs> I couldn't find any the time I got it. The meeting began <clears throat> in much the same way we began here tonight. They read that portion of our, our recovery program, of our book that constitutes our recovery program. They read our steps. And incidentally, if you're new, there's a lot of confusion in AA. Today. We were mixed up with so many things. You ought to know this if you're new. I'm going to tell you right now. You'll hear the refrain over and over here, if you want what we have. That's what we have. Those 12 steps. That's what we have. That's the answer, if you're wondering. And if you wish to recover from your disease, you must take those 12 steps. They are not suggested. They are required. They are mandatory. You have to do it. If you do it, you get better. If you don't do it, you get worse. And you get worse while you sit in AA meetings. So if you're associating with a group of people who are telling you all you have to do is put the body here and the rest will happen to you, get away from them. That's wrong. You must do much more here. Now, I know that to be true. I very nearly died learning that lesson. Because when I heard these 12 steps read at that meeting in the basement of that Presbyterian church, in November of 1965, I heard nothing new. Nothing new. I am the end product of eight years of Dominican nuns and four years of Jesuit priests. And there is nothing new there to me. That is all very broad brush strokes. I had lived by most of this all of my life. And it did not change the way that I lived my life. It certainly had nothing to do with the way that I drank alcohol. So if there was one thing I knew at my very first AA meeting, it was that this did not work for me. We call some of these things by different names where I come from, that's all. You talk about a searching and fearless moral inventory. I know all about that. I call that examination of conscience where I'm from. You talk about admitting to God and to another human being the exact nature of your wrongs. You talk about it like it's a big deal. I do that every Saturday afternoon from the time I'm seven years old through the time I'm 18. And I suppose it's okay. And it might work for you. Maybe it works for Presbyterians. But it does not work for me. Because I'm capable of leaving that confessional and going out there and doing everything that brought me in there immediately. So if there's one thing I knew in my first AA meeting in November of 1965 is that my case is different. I am not like you, and I really don't belong here. And that meeting began, and they had several people participate. A bunch of dentists and insurance salesmen, I'm sure. <laughs> and they were all married to pretty blonde Al-Anon wives who sat in the front row and did needlepoint during the AA meeting. That's one of those. And, and they all said innocuous things that had nothing to do with my life, I'm sure they had. One guy in particular, I'll never forget him, he got up and he said uh, six months prior to that evening, why, he uh, he got drunk and he blew the mortgage payment on his house. And then he found you splendid people and this wonderful program. And his life was marvelous. Now, I turned to Tex. <laughs> and I said, where do you send the difficult cases, Tex? 
And he said, shut up. <laughs> Something equally as appropriate. And the meeting continued. And if I had any doubts as to whether I belonged there or not, they were cured at the conclusion of that meeting because they had their then birthday parties. Birthday parties. They're embarrassing, aren't they, if you're new? I mean, have you ever seen birthday parties in AA? Rooms full of middle-aged people sing happy birthday to some jerk who went for a year without drinking. And they have cakes with candles on them. And they, it's, you know, it's really like some kind of cheap psychotherapy, you know, some kind of pop psychology. It's like, reminds me of something you would do right after dance therapy, you know, <laughs> before you go down to work on your wallet. And they had a series of these imbecilic birthday parties. And uh, one gal in particular, she was 110 and uh, she'd been sober forever. They had a bonfire on top of this cake. They came down the aisle with it. And they sang happy birthday to her, and she huffed and puffed to get these candles out, and I thought the pulmonary disease would get her first. I'll tell you, she got them out. She got up here, and she said her name was Phoebe, and she was an alcoholic. And then she said something about, did I want what she had? <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you, my standards were not high that night, it's true, but geez, you'd have to take a long look at Phoebe, and you would pass, is what you would do. That's what I did. I think it's safe to say that I did not have a spiritual awakening. In my first AA meeting, I did not make any insightful discovery as to what my living... We're big on that today. Have you made an insightful discovery as to what your living problem is today? I did not. But I'll tell you what I did. I did not drink any alcohol, nor did I use any mind-affecting chemical for the following three and one-half years. And during that period of time... I participated in every facet of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did everything there was to do in AA. I joined every committee known to man in AA. I washed coffee cups, and they had real coffee cups then, and you washed them. I emptied ashtrays and I washed them. I swept floors, set up chairs, was secretary of groups, was a member of the general service committee. I did everything there was to do in AA. Except one thing. I did not take these steps. And as a result, my alcoholism got worse. And it got worse while I sat in AA meeting after AA meeting. It got worse while I did all the busy work in AA. And you know what? I knew it was getting worse. It was an evident... And you know what? There are people here tonight who are in the same boat. And they know they're getting worse. Because... And there are, there are other people here tonight who are getting better. And they know they're getting better. You know, it's a great thing about AA. Nobody needs a scorecard here. Everybody knows who everybody is. And when people get better here, they never have to tell you about it. Because recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous is visually perceptible. People wear it. It's all over them. There's something in their eyes, something going on. They have a sense of purpose about their lives, and they're going somewhere. And people like me sit in the back, and we go nowhere. Because we're consumed with resentment and hostility and loneliness, and we are losers. And we don't like to be around you winners. Because you make us feel bad. And I watched people come into AA long after I had been here. And their conversation is filled with strange things to me. They talk about developing a relationship with a higher power. And writing an inventory and making amends. And these things are alien to me. And they get better and I don't. And I used to have a war cry in those years in AA. I used to think, when do I get mine? When does it happen for me here? I used to think they had secret meetings somewhere where they gave each other the real secret, you know, because it could not be this. Now, I started to look good on the outside in a hurry because uh, I was 24 years old and uh, I have a good education. And, a, and, a, uh, and incidentally, while I'm at it, let me tell you about my family. I have a magnificent family, a huge, wonderful, marvelous Irish Catholic family with money, Okay. I, I'm of privilege. I've had every advantage in the world. And not only are they, did I have every material advantage, I had every emotional advantage and spiritual advantage that I know of. I knew I was loved. I always knew I was loved. My family made sure I knew I was loved. 
I am the product of a classic Roman Catholic education, the very best money can buy. And you know what? I knew I was loved by them, too. The nuns did not inflict guilt on me. I did not learn about a god of fear. All I got from those people was a magnificent education, a sense of belonging to a group of people who cared about what happened to me all of my life. Therefore, my alcoholism is not the fault of the Roman Catholic Church. And if you are new out there, neither is yours. I discovered an amazing thing here when it finally came time to write that inventory. And that thing is, my life is my fault. And boy, is that grim. It's bad news. I'd love to hang it on them. i got to tell you, but they're not going to accept it. They are not going to take the blame. Now, in 1966, I met a beautiful girl. Well, first of all, there was a new profession opened up. and so I'll tell you what, what happened to me. I, uh, I went right through uh, prep schools, four different prep schools. I got thrown out of one every year uh, for behavior. I always had good grades, but I was always a behavior problem. I was always the kind of kid in prep school to sit in the guidance council, some Jesuit's office, and they were always saying things to me like, why do you, why do you do this? I mean, why, why? You have, you have potential. Do you know about potential? You have talent. You're bright. You're, why are you, why do you, why are you so self-destructive? Beats the hell out of me. I don't, you know. I mean, I wish I knew. I would tell you. I don't want to be, I don't want this to happen to me. And I would get thrown out of one every year. And I finally graduated. The last prep school, I, I graduated, but I was thrown out before graduation. And I had to, as a matter of fact, I was going to give the valedictory address. I was number one in the class. And I didn't even get to go to the graduation. They mailed me my diploma. And, uh, but that education and, and that brought me right through an Ivy League university. And I have a degree in biochemistry. And I went in the Navy. And for five years, they sent me to one medical school after another. And I received some really unique medical training. So... In 1966, a new profession opened up in civilian medicine called the Physician assi- Physician's Assistant or Physician's Associate Program, where they took people such as I, who had this unique training in the service, and they, they put us to work in civilian medicine, and they licensed us to go into emergency rooms and essentially practice primary medicine, is what we did. We, we worked nights, and we saw the patients, and we evaluated them, and we prescribed uh, medicine, and we sutured the last... Ra- we did everything that a physician does in an emergency room, except we were not MDs. Which I suppose you might find a little terrifying if you have to go to the emergency room tonight, but you... <laughs> but they are those who are doing it, who are well-trained and qualified. You can rest easy. I'm not anymore, but there are those that are, and they're well-qualified. And I became one of the very first licensed PAs in the state of California, and I went to work in an industrial emergency room in the Huntington Park area, and I met a beautiful girl, the daughter of a longtime sober AA member. And we fell in love and we got married. And everybody in AA said, what a grand couple they are. She's pretty and he's got a great job. And she's an al and he's an AA. Aren't they doing great? They're just, things are just marvelous. Except they really weren't. A funny thing happened on the way to ecstasy. I would go in this emergency room sometimes at night, but I had not taken these steps, and I had no AA program, and I would get depressed. Now, I had no program, but I had an excellent medical education, and I know how to take care of depression. <laughs> I used Dexedrine. <laughs> Fifteen milligram spantules work best. Now, before I was through with those, I was taking seven or eight a day. Now, anyone here that knows anything about amphetamine abuse understands. That has you moving right along, is what that does. I tell you. Whatever you're doing, you'll do it quick, let me tell you. But the problem with that is, long about the fifth or sixth day whereby you've not slept nor eaten, your hair stands on end, boy, and your eyes dilate out, and you show up in the ER to help the sick. It looks bad. You know, it really does. It looks bad. And, uh, and uh, they get upset. But there's a remedy for that, and the remedy is a drug called Demerol. <laughs> now, everybody in AA today knows all about Demerol. There used to be a day when people didn't know what Demerol was, but Demerol is, incidentally, for the one sheltered soul out there that may not know, is a narcotic. And by narcotic, we refer to a lot of drugs uh, 
we call them narcotics that are not narcotics. Demerol, however, is a narcotic. Yeah. A real narcotic. Now, you know what narcotics are? They all come from opium. There's a whole family of them. Heroin, morphine, dilaudid. Demerol is actually a synthetic, but it's a, it's a, narc- it's a narcotic. It, uh, what I mean is you, t- you inject Demerol intravenously and you become addicted. Period. You do not necessarily need an addictive personality. <laughs> You don't have to worry about things like denial. (laughs) What you need to get addicted to Demerol is a syringe and a needle. That's what you need. And I became addicted. But unfortunately, there's another term connected with drugs like Demerol that's uh, fraught with meaning. It's called controlled substance. Let me tell you what that means. That means that there are people whose entire lives are dedicated to Finding lost Demerol. <laughs> yeah. So that means. You've met some of them, I see, haven't you? Yeah. They are people like pharmacists and medical administrators and, uh, Jesus. I'll tell you, they are perpetually involved with, they are very, I'll tell you, they are very, very picayune people. They are, they have no vision. They are people who are constantly measuring cc's in small vials. What a small way to live your life. You know, I mean, really. And these are the kind of... And let me tell you about the people who care the very most about what happens to Demerol. They are the folks on the California State Narcotics Control Board. They care more than you would ever know. Yeah. We say in Alcoholics Anonymous that we care. Not like they care. Let me tell you. They, They came into that emergency room one night, or early one Friday morning, actually, and they inspected the narcotics logs, and all roads lead to Rome, <laughs> and I got caught. And they placed me under arrest like a criminal, <laughs> like a common drug addict. And they took me downtown to the Los Angeles County Jail, right in my little green scrub suit. <laughs> we went downtown. And charged me with a felony, appropriating narcotics for my own use. Now, that was subsequently reduced to a misdemeanor. And I did not have to go to jail. But I'll tell you what happened. I lost my medical license. And I'll never forget the day that that happened. I did not. Contrary to if you're new, maybe you identify with this. I did. You know what I felt when they took my license away? An overwhelming sense of relief. Because I didn't have to live that way anymore. I did not go to medical school so I could go in the ER and steal the dope. That was never my intention. And so I had a sense of relief that I didn't have to live that way anymore. But to make a long story short, this beautiful young girl that I married and I ended up spending the summer of 1972 living in an apartment in Englewood, California by the Los Angeles airport. Apartment. It was a hovel. It wasn't an apartment. It was a dreadful place. And we spent July and August of 1972 with my drinking one half gallon of vodka every day, and she watched. That's what we did in July and August of 1972. Now, I, there are many people here who are familiar with that kind of drinking. That's a, again, you know, you don't when you drink a half gallon of vodka a day, you do not have to worry about diagnoses. <laughs> You don't have to worry about what your personality is like. You know. If you drink a half gallon of vodka a day, certain things will happen to you. Period. Whether you're alcoholic or non-alcoholic. You drink a half gallon of vodka a day, you will vomit bile. You will have little seizures. You'll be in and out of blackout, and you don't, won't know what day it is, and you won't know what time it is. And if you look at a clock, it says 6 o'clock. It could be 6 a.m. It could be 6 p.m. And in, in those rare moments when you have some lucidity, you are terrified. Because that's what it's like to drink a half gallon of vodka a day. And that's what we did in July and August. And finally, in the beginning of September, her family came and they got her. And if you're like me, you lose 35 pounds in July and August of 1972. And in the beginning of September, her family came and they got her. And they took her out of there and they took the furniture and the car. When they leave me, they take everything. I'm going to tell you. They take the car, the drapes, you know. It all goes. There's nothing left but the paint on the walls. And that's the way it was. That's where I was left. 
I remember sitting in the middle of the floor of this apartment in a Turkish robe. Everybody has a Turkish bathrobe and, and before you get And I had mine, and it was at one time it was white. You know what it was then. And I had not shaved or bathed. And I sat in the middle of the floor with a half gallon of the vodka, and I remember the doorbell rang, and the guy came in to take the phone out. And he looked around that apartment, and he looked at me, and, and he looked at that apartment, and he knew. You know, you know he, was not, he did not have to be a genius, you know. And I, he said to me, uh, my God, he said, your family left you. And I said, no, we're redecorating. <laughs> not really. And I think that says as much about alcoholism as anything that I know. You might say, even then, I was not a surrendered alcoholic. <clears throat> now, uh, I was in and out of blackouts, and I had some money, and I would get over to that liquor store, and the rent was coming due, and I, but I wasn't even aware of it. I just knew that I got over there, and I would get a half gallon of vodka at that liquor store, and I'd carry it back, and I'd drink it, and it might take 24 hours. Maybe it would take 26. I don't know. But it would get done. And I, didn't, and I was in and out of blackouts, and I became conscious in Newport Beach. <laughs> I got myself to Newport Beach somehow, and I didn't know how, except I, that's where I came out of a blackout. I became conscious of where I was. It was in the early September 1972. The temperature was 120. I was in a three-piece suit and a white shirt and a tie, a wool suit, sitting on a bench on the Balboa Peninsula with a copy of the Santa Ana Register in my... I knew I needed a job, and I'm going through the classified ads, and I have a suitcase next to me with some clothes in it. And that's how I became conscious of where I was. I knew I needed a job, and I found a job that day, too, as a matter of fact. I found a job as an apprentice embalmer for a mortician <laughs> in Costa Mesa, California, and it, and it was just a, it was awful, god-awful job. If you're new and you need a job, give that a pass. Don't do that. That's... <laughs> and the job paid $85 a week, and a fringe benefit was an apartment over the casket room. <laughs> right. Have you ever walked through the casket room with a hangover in the morning? <laughs> It will set you free, let me tell you. <laughs> and it was just awful. And, I, and the, the mortician, was a, he was a ghoul, is what he was. He was just a dreadful character who, he looked bad, and he drug his leg when he walked. You know, something. He really did. He was, like a, he was like a keeper of a gate, you know. And, he, and we did not get along well. I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. And long and short of it was, I got drunk and stole his hearse, is what I did. And I, <laughs> on September the 20th, 1972, I found myself driving the wrong way on Pacific Coast Highway in Newport Beach, California, with a young lady next to me who I did not recall meeting, who was screaming hysterically. And it occurred to me then, something that had occurred to me often, I had an over... You know what, I, I saw my... If you would have asked me at that moment what my overriding problem was in life, I could have told you, you know what my problem is? I'm predisposed to get involved with neurotic women. That's my problem. And you know what? This, you, this, she, she's, this woman is, I told her, I said, you are unstable. You really are. You are, you are unstable and you overreact. You really do. And the reason I knew that to be true is because when I got this hearse turned around going the right way, she continued to scream. And I told him, besides that, I said, beside that, I've watched you drink this evening, and I think you are probably an alcoholic. And what you should do is go to AA. I would go there with you, but it does not work for me. My case is different. It would, however, work for you, I'm certain, because you are lack sensitivity, and you are not too bright. You'd fit in well in AA. You ought to go there. Now, that was September the 20th, 1972. And what you should know is I have not had a drink of alcohol, nor have I used any mind-affecting chemical from that night to this. And that's, uh, well, for me, it's real good news. <laughs> Especially if, for me, it's great news. But more than that, if you could have materialized in the back of that damn hearse, if you would have told me, if you could have told me the future, if you would have said to me, for the next almost 15 years, you are not going to drink any alcohol, nor are you going to use any mind-affecting chemical whatsoever. But you are going to become desperate enough to become willing to take a series of actions that seemingly have nothing to do with what you perceive to be wrong with you. 
And as a result of those actions, you are going to gain a measure of recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. I would not have believed you. I was willing to admit to you in September the 20th, 1972, that I did not know much about what was good for me. I mean, the jury was in on that. (laughs) But I did know that whatever good was going to happen to me, it would not happen in Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew that. That was fact. I had been to AA. Boy, had I been to AA. And AA does not work for me. But I'll tell you what, I brought that guy's hearse back to him and he was upset. He was really upset. And he was in the apartment over the casket room throwing my clothes out the window. And all of a sudden it was 6 a.m. and the sun was coming up in Costa Mesa and everything I owned was strewn all over this black top parking lot. I had no money, no job, no car, no place to live. I don't know about you, but every time I get in that kind of shape, I go to AA. That's what I do. (laughs) That was in September of 1972. And and all there was available was the Costa Mesa Alano Club. That was it. There were no detoxes in September. There were no treatment centers, no care units in September of 1972. There was simply the Costa Mesa Alano Club. And... uh, I suppose it wouldn't have done me any good if there were. They probably would have diagnosed me as not being alcoholic. I didn't have any medical insurance. <laughs> probably. They probably would have said, you don't belong. I don't know. I, you know, they're fine. I don't put them down. They're, you know, they're, they're great. But I would not have... Uh, there weren't any there. That's all. They're, they just didn't exist in September of 1972. All there was was the Costa Mesa Alano Club, and it was not much. Let me tell you. And I got my all my belongings in a cardboard box, and I took it to the Costa Mesa Auto Club. And I sat at the coffee bar, and I had a cup of coffee. And they had an AA meeting there that noon. And I suppose it'd be nice if I could tell you that I had a spiritual awakening. I didn't. You know what it was? It was a noontime Milano Club meeting. Have you ever been to one of those? They are grim. Four out-of-work plumbers, right? Sitting around a long table, clutching coffee cups. Telling each other how wonderful it was, they put the plug in the jug. Drove me crazy. They had another AA meeting there that night. I sat through that meeting. Nothing. It was the same as the earlier meeting. And the manager of the club let me sleep on the uh, on the sofa because I didn't have anywhere to go. And the next day, I got in a gin rummy game with some ladies in that club and won twenty five bucks. And I went out and I rented a room on Federal Avenue in Costa Mesa for eleven dollars a week. If you'd like to know what that room was like, just uh, use your imagination. You'd be correct. It was uh, an $11 a week room. I remember when I moved in there, I thought, my God, I'll have to stay here a couple weeks until I can get it together because I don't have any other options. And I, and it was really, it was awful. I can't live in a place like this. I don't think I can stay here for two weeks. Two years later, when I moved out of that room, <laughs> I want you to understand that it did not look that bad. This amazing thing happened to me. The following two years that I spent in Newport Beach, Costa Mesa area of California, were the most remarkable years of my life. They were utterly amazing. But the most significant thing about those two years, and if you're new, I'd like you to know that I did not know that when I was living in them. They were the most formative years I have ever spent. Tremendous things happened to me. In 1973 and in 1974 in Newport Beach, California, and I was not aware of any of it. If you would have asked me at any given period during that time frame, how is your life? I would have said it is God awful. I would like to kill myself. I got and lost a series of jobs in that time frame that are absolutely idiotic. I lost a job as a gas station attendant for being incompetent. I put, I had gas pumps going in cars in a, in a one busy Saturday and I locked all the wrong gas caps on. People left with a key that did not fit the gas cap that was on their car. And you know, you know what I mean? And they all came back on Wednesday upset. And, uh, and the guy that fired me from that, you know, he was a, from Texas too, that son of a bitch. And he said to me, I'll never forget what he said. He said, uh, we've got to let you go. He's good. We got to let you go, son. He said, it's too bad because you are a trier. He said, you are a trier, and I can see you're trying, but you're not quite bright enough for this kind of work. (laughs) 
He was right. I got and lost a job as a drill press operator in a factory for a dollar eighty-seven cents an hour. It was at, I'll never forget it, it was on Placentia Boulevard in Costa Mesa. It was a machine shop made out of stone. It was like something out of Dickens. Uh, it really was. It was just like the, the workhouse in Dickens. It was just, a, a, you walked in there and they had this long machines all grounded in stone, you know, based on stone. And it, as far as the eye could see was this long bench with drills over it. And all of these poor wretched souls would sit on these stools and put holes in these copper plates for $1.87 an hour. And I, I took my place with the masses on these stools, and I started to put holes in copper plates. Now, what you did is you, they wheeled up a cart with 8 million copper plates in them, and you took a copper plate, and you put it under the drill, and you pulled the handle and put a hole in the middle of the... You could not... That's it. That is the job. You know, that you really can't screw that up. Except I put the hole in the wrong place and about 900 of these copper plates in and the foreman, who was originally from right outside of Dallas, <laughs> said to me, we got to let you go, boy. He said, it's too bad. You can't, uh, you're not up to this task. He said, you can't do this. He says, and you're trying real hard. He says, if something comes up that we feel you can handle, we'll call you back. And I said, you don't understand. You jerk. Boy, I'm crazy. I said, you know, you're t- I went to, I graduated from Cornell. He said, I'll tell you what, boy. You better go back and take the course and drill press operating. I'll tell you, you know, you got That was on a Thursday in February of 1973. I'll never forget it. I went back to this $11 a week room, and uh, and I, I, I was, you know, it wasn't funny in February of 1973. Sounds funny, 15 years. It wasn't funny then. I was 31 years old. I could not hold a job as a drill press operator or as a gas station attendant. The only thing I was educated to do, they had taken my license. There was no human being left that wanted anything to do with me in February of 1973. Nobody wanted to talk to me. It was over. And I was frightened. I, you know what they do with young men who are 31 who can't make it on the streets? They put them in places like Patton and, and, and uh, Camarillo. And they, you know, you weave baskets. You do things. I, I, it was a real fear in February of 1973. I remember going back to this room and it was raining. And I walked up the hill to Superior. I went back to this room and I, I remember getting, getting there was some mail that had caught up with me. And one of them was a, uh, I'll never forget it, it was an invitation to join the committee for my uh, 10th class reunion at Cornell. And it was signed by Charles Medoff, M.D. And I remember reading that letter, and it was the most depressing moment I think I have ever had. I remember thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what, should I return the letter? Should I write him a letter? Should I say, "I sorry, can't make it this year, Dr. Medoff, signed, you know, drill press operator Vince Yo, O.W., out of work. You know, it, uh, it was the most god awful day that I can remember and it got worse I went to the, the meeting that night which was the my home group which was a, the Ebel Club on uh, on the Balboa Peninsula which is a great meeting a big speaker meeting a big California speaker meeting and, uh, and the people there were wonderful it's great AA except that they, they would tie their yachts up in the back and come into the meeting I, I'd go in there boy I'd get on a downer I'll tell you it would be grim and, uh, and I don't even remember who talked I remember sitting through that meeting and it was raining and, uh, and after the meeting I I remember I had a, I got a ride part way and then I had to walk the rest of the way home and I was soaking wet and I got into that room and I remember thinking, my God, the jig is up. It's all over. I don't have any other answers. Uh, I don't know what else to do and I'm afraid and I'm, a, I'm frightened and I'm lonely and I don't know what's going to happen to me. And as a result of that despair, I did something so stupid I can't believe it. The most ridiculous thing I'd ever done. It made absolutely no sense whatsoever. But I got so desperate, I found myself on my knees beside the bed in that $11 a week room. And I said a prayer. A simple, unsophisticated, the Jesuits would not have been proud. It was simply, God, please help me. Because I'm afraid, and I'm alone, and I can't make it anymore. Now, as far as I'm concerned... My recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous began that night. And if you are new or relatively new here tonight, and you would like to know where to start, that's as good a place as I know of. Because I can tell you something about that action. That works. I received the help. I did not receive the kind of help I thought I needed. (laughs) 
but I receive the help. And the beauty of that action is, it is not necessary that you believe in that God, or it's not necessary that you believe in that prayer. You don't have to think it will work. We are not concerned with what you think if you're new. What you think is irrelevant. If you are willing to take the action, Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of action. And that prayer worked for me. But it did not work in the way that I thought it should, and it did not work very quickly. Because I, I remember going back to, I got a job with a guy, a guy gave me a job. A guy also from Texas, incidentally, as, as luck would have it, but I'm gonna tell you about this guy. His name was Clarence Page. Clarence Page was a carpet layer. A one-man operation. Clarence bought carpet and he sold it and he installed it. Clarence did it all. And Clarence said to me, he said, you know, he was always saying things to me in that Alano club. He was always saying things to me like, you're gonna be alright. Don't worry. You're gonna be alright. You're bright. You're gonna, you're gonna come out of this. You're gonna get a job and you're gonna, someday you're gonna come down here and, and, uh, you're gonna be a big deal. I'd listen to Clarence and I think, god damn, he's right. You know, Clarence is right. <laughs> then Clarence would leave. <laughs> I think he's wrong. Clarence doesn't know what he's talking about. But Clarence was sober 11 years. And on this Friday after this meeting, he said to me, how'd you like a job? He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay you $10 a day and provide your meals. Now that sounded to me like the presidency of General Motors. It really did. I'll tell you, it's a matter of perspective. I went to work for Clarence Page, and I was his gopher. I went for the carpet, I went for the tools, and I went for the coffee. And I worked for Clarence Page, the carpet layer, for about 14 months. He paid me $10 a day, and he provided my meals. And my aid program consisted of this sim- simplistic, childish prayer that I said every night, except something happened to me about three months down the line. I'll never forget it. I, was, I can pinpoint the moment it happened. I was on Balboa Island, and I was eating a frozen banana with a bunch of other winners. <laughs> and it occurred to me that I felt good. The kind of feel good that comes in here. You know what I'm talking about? I not, had nothing to do, certainly had nothing to do with my wretched life. It had to do with something else and it amazed me. I couldn't figure it out. Why should I feel good? By my standards, I should take gas. My life is dreadful. But something happened to me and I knew that I didn't have to drink and I didn't have to use drugs and that whatever was going to happen to me, somehow it would be okay. And it was an amazing discovery. And I continued to, and as time went by, I even acquired some material possessions. I got a 1964 red Chevrolet convertible with no brakes and a hole in the top. <laughs> I started to drive that to the Ebel Club on Thursday night, I'll tell you. And I would pull into the parking lot there and they would, uh, they'd all hurry up and get in their Mercedes and BMWs and put them on the other side of the lot, is what they would do. They were always asking me questions like, uh, do you have insurance on that car? That was a big question, you know. Hell, I didn't have a, I hadn't had a driver's license in three years. Why the hell would I have insurance? You know, absolute redundancy. I didn't tell him that though. It would upset him. Pretty soon my first birthday had come and gone and my second birthday had come and gone and it occurred to me I'm two years sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. I work for Clarence the Carpet Layer. I don't have anything going for me except this prayer and, and the idea that I am sober. And I know that I need help of a more practical nature. So I decided, I made a momentous decision. I decided to get a sponsor. I'm not very quick. And I got this, and you know what, I'd been fighting this battle for a long time because I knew who the sponsor had to be. Have you ever been through that? But I just fought this with every fiber of my being. Because I didn't like this guy. That was clear. I did not like him. He was arrogant. And he was pompous. And he was self-serving. And he was, and he was crazier than hell. I mean, he was 16 years sober at the time, and if you heard this guy speak, he's a big shot guest speaker in AA. And he, and he was, he had all of that arrogance with that. And he, and he just was, but I'm gonna tell you about this guy. He had an apparent, amazing facility for helping losers in Alcoholics Anonymous. It was undeniable. We would watch, 
People go to him. Hopeless cases in Orange County that everyone else had given up on. They'd go join this guy's fascist AA group on the west side of Los Angeles. And they'd do, take, do a series of things that, were, that had nothing, no relationship at all to AA as near as I could tell. But they would get better. Because they'd come back down. And there, one guy in particular, I'll never forget him. Manchester Red the Biker. <laughs> Let me tell you about Red. Red never bathed nor shaved. And he wore tank tops, and he had all his teeth kicked in, and he had a terrible beard, and he was always drunk, and he had a bottle of Canadian Club in the meetings in his back pocket, and, and all he wanted to do was, he wanted to kill people and maim them in the meeting. Anyway, you went to a meeting and Red was there, and you thought, oh Jesus, you know, I really wish I went downtown. <clears throat> Red dropped out of sight. Went and got this guy for a sponsor, and we didn't hear anything about him. About six months later, he showed up in Newport Beach. Only no one recognized him because he had his hair cut and his beard shaved and all of his dental work done. And he had on a, a pair of great wool gray slacks and a navy blue blazer and a school tie and penny loafers. He was sitting in the meeting <laughs> like a gentleman, quiet. And pretty soon somebody says, there's red. That can't be red. It's red. Look at him. It's red. My God, it was red. <laughs> The meeting started and they called on him to share. And Red got up and said six months prior to that evening, he'd made his first child support payment in ten years. And not only that, but next month he was going to vote in the presidential election. <laughs> For the Republican, too, I'll tell you. Really would knock you right out. So I guess Red pushed me over the edge. And I call this guy up. And I asked him for help. And he said, I'll tell you what you do, kid. He said, come on up here and see me. Have lunch with me. We'll talk about it. And he ran a mission on Skid Row in Los Angeles. And, uh, and he wanted me to come up there and have lunch with him. So I, I drove this old car, this beat up old car up there. And I, I went in there to see him. And we had a little talk. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, I will agree to help you. And it might be the most significant thing I have ever heard in AA. And if you're new, I hope you find somebody who says this to you. He said to me, I will agree to help you on one condition. And that condition is, can you accept the simple proposition that your best judgment about what you ought to do about your life is terrible and that my judgment about what you ought to do about your life is infinitely better than yours? If you can accept that proposition... I can help you. And so I'm glad, grateful tonight that I was desperate enough to make this unholy pact with the devil. <laughs> so I agreed to do this. And the first thing he said to me is he looked out and he said, that car out there. He said, do you have insurance on that car? I said, no. He said, do you have a driver's license? I said, no. He said, give me the keys. I said, wait a minute. That's my car. Why should I give you the keys? I'll never forget what he told me. He said, I can answer that real easy. You should give me the keys because law-abiding citizens such as myself have a right to drive on the city streets free from fear of morons like you. <laughs> How do you argue with that? I gave him the keys. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to move into this mission and live here. I said, you don't understand. I've come to you for upward mobility. I live in Newport Beach. Why the hell do I want to move into a mission on Skid Row? And he said, uh, do you have a better idea? So I moved into the mission on Skid Row in Los Angeles. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to come down to my office every day at 10 o'clock. And I'm going to give you an allowance, $8 a day. And I want you to put on that suit you have. And I want you to get this eight dollars and I want you to go outside and get on that number 83 bus that runs up Wilshire Boulevard and get a series of transfers along the way. And I want you to get off and to go into every hospital and medical facility between downtown Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley. And I want you to tell them that you need help in getting your medical license restored, that you are sober and free from drugs for over two years in AA and you need a job. I said, that's the most preposterous thing I have ever heard. That's ridiculous. It'll never work. And he said, do you have a better idea? 
I said, I'll take the eight dollars. And he said, at the end of the day, you'll end up on the west side of L.A. You'll go to one of the Pacific Group meetings, then you'll take the bus back down here to the mission where you live. And by the way, take the bus. Don't have anybody drive you because they work. They have to get up early in the morning. You don't. So ride the bus back down. So every day I rode the bus up Bullshit Boulevard. And I lived in, I'm here to tell you, I lived in the Midnight Mission on Skid Row in Los Angeles for eight months. I rode the bus up Wilshire Boulevard every day. I got eight dollar allowance and I rode and I was, and then that eight month period, I was in every medical facility between downtown Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley four times. I heard no. I was in the Good Samaritan and Cedars of Sinai and St. John's and Santa Monica Hospital and Queen of Angels. I was in the places like the Elmer Belt Urological Clinic. Okay? I went anywhere they'd let me in the door. And I'd go back and tell this guy, I'd say, you know what, goggles, you're wrong, four eyes. Because I'll tell you, nobody is going to hire, that's before I had glasses, you, nobody's ever going to hire me. And he'd say, why don't you shut up and just go do it. I never could quite work up a response to that. It was always just me. And so I did what he said. And I did it every day. And the worst day of my life was one Friday morning in May of 1975 because it was a nice day. The sun was out and I put on this three-piece suit. I went outside to ride that bus up Wilshire Boulevard one more time. And it was a sunny day on Skid Row. You know what it's like when you live in a mission on Skid Row and the sun's out? It's bad. It's much better if it's raining, I'll tell you. Because when the sun's out, you somebody somewhere, the sun's shining on them and they're happy. And their life's together. And my life is a mess. I don't have any life. I am a loser. You know what I am? I'm two years and eight months sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have no job, no car, no money, and, and I am a loser. I don't know anybody doing worse than me. Newcomers are doing better than me. And I have this idiotic direction. I don't, and the only reason I'm doing it today, I'll tell you, on this Friday, is because I can't think of anything else. And I went outside and I got on that 83 bus. And the first thing I did was I sat down in a big wad of chewing gum. <laughs> and I got it all over the back of my pants. And I got off the bus at Western about a mile, and I went into this 76 station in the men's room, and I found myself standing in that men's room with my trousers in my left hand and wet paper towels in this hand, trying to clean the chewing gum off the back of the... Have you ever tried that? With The goddamn gum goes all the way down the back, and it just is a disgusting mess. And it, You know, I, I'm the biggest grotesque loser I have ever... You know, I think maybe, you know, I got if I can go to the end of the line and get some lunch and sit in a movie, maybe I won't drink. That's all I have today. That's the best I've got. I might not drink if I sit in a movie. And I put my pants back on, I got on the bus, and I rode to the end of the line, and I went through the mall in, 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 in Santa Monica, and I went through this cafeteria, and I got a tray of lunch, and I sat it down, went outside to get a newspaper, and the busboy came by and took my lunch. <laughs> Just took it away. I mean, uh, and I got about six bucks left, and I got over to Westwood Village by the UCLA campus, and I walked through that village, and I... Uh, I went to the Bruin Theater, the, the, the movie theater, and I stood in line to buy a ticket. And while I was standing on that line, I heard somebody call my name. And I turned around. It was the administrator of the medical center in which I had been arrested in for stealing narcotics. And he said, my God, where have you been? We thought you were in an institution or dead somewhere. And I said, no, I'm sober in AA. I don't drink. And I, you know, I'm two years now. And he, his eyes lit up, and he said, my God, you look great. He said, your eyes are clear, and you look terrific, and it's Friday, and you're in the line to go to a movie. And he was so profoundly impressed, he started to cry, and he put his arms around me. He thought this was a big deal. And he said, have you worked? I said, I haven't worked in a long time. And he said, we have a urologist who's joined our group practice, who's a member of the Medical Quality Assurance Board. My God, you've got to come down tomorrow. I'm going to introduce you. We'll have lunch, all of us, in it. Maybe he can write some letters and get your license back. And if he can, how would you like a job back in that same emergency room? I went down and met that urologist the following day. He wrote some letters. Within 60 days, my medical license was restored in the state of California. I went back to work in the very same emergency room in which I was arrested in for stealing narcotics. I worked there for the following two and a half years. And during that period of time, I am most grateful to report to you tonight that no drugs were missing. <laughs> and the patients that went through that emergency room received good care. I know because I gave it to them. And I'll tell you something else. I took these steps, one through twelve. I wrote that searching and fearless moral inventory on paper. And you know what I wrote if you're new? I've got bad news for you. Don't we want to know when you write that inventory? 
the secrets, the bad things, the things you don't want to tell us. Never mind all that gas about write nice things about yourself. Tell us the secrets. That is the inventory here. That's what you have to give away. That's the monkey you have to get off your back here. I took these steps. I read that inventory of this crazy sponsor by flashlight underneath the dashboard of his car one night. He was going to make a talk out in the desert, and we rode along. So I took the sixth and the seventh step, and I began to get a measure of recovery. And I suppose it would be nice to say I can sit down now and tell you it's all the wonderful from that day to this. Why, nothing bad's happened, and I've just walked along the great, wonderful path of happy destiny. That's baloney. That's not what you get here if you're new. There is no utopia here. You make mistakes here. Everybody makes mistakes. I have made all of them. And I am living testimony to the fact that you will not get drunk from making a mistake. Only perhaps if you try to defend it. I have done everything wrong. In, in August of 1976, I met a cute little redhead. We, got, we met in August, got married in September, and divorced in October. <laughs> and the last time I saw her, she was on the way back to her daddy's ranch in El Dorado, Texas. Here, to say it all. <laughs> but I'll tell you what happened to me. I didn't drink. And I didn't run. And I was able to stay here with you and tell you all about it. And I was able to take all of the heat that that engendered. I have a sponsor with a perverse sense of humor. We had planned this big marriage that we had already eloped, but that's another story. And, and we had all of these invitations and napkins that said Vince and Linda on them. He made me take them to his backyard so everybody ate a hot dog and his, these napkins. That had, he's really a cruel, cruel man. <laughs> the point is, I didn't run and I didn't drink and I survived. And so will you if you're new. Uh, I have a magnificent life today. I'm married to a woman who's sober 12 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. She is a beautiful woman, and I love her very much. But more importantly, I like her. And I think the most amazing thing has happened to me with regard to relationships, and that this, and I, only as a result of AA, and this woman, do I know this? I would have died without ever, don't I know? Women are not the enemy. It's an amazing thing. And we're a team. We're on the same side. And we're kind of walking through it together. We have our moments, but we have much better moments. And our life is good. I'm in a new business today, one I never thought I'd ever be in. It has nothing to do with medicine, it has to do with something else. But it's my business, my firm. My firm. I have a suite of offices on Wilshire Boulevard in the Travelers Building with a big picture window that overlooks Wilshire Boulevard, for God's sake. You can't get there from where I came. And, I, and days when I think I'm getting screwed, you know what I do? I go over that window, window and I look out for that 83 bus. <laughs> comes right beneath my window. <laughs> and when it comes on by, why, I know I've got a hell of a deal. And I'm okay. i got a big house in Pasadena, and I drive a fancy German car. And my life is great. And so I just want to tell you if you're new, especially if you're new, you know what? You really want to know why we're here. And, and I can tell you why we're not here. We are not here because of any advance in mental health. <laughs> we are not here because some psychiatrist has made some kind of insightful discovery. That's not why we're here. The sum total of everything... Let me tell you something. If science had an answer for what's wrong with you and I, I'd have found it. I would have known all about it, believe me. It's not there. The sum total of everything they've done hasn't even scratched what's happened as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, pure and simple. We are here tonight because a stockbroker stood in a hotel lobby in Akron, Ohio in June of 1935 who had been sober for six months and really didn't know why he was sober. He'd been trying to, he had a spiritual experience and he'd spent six months trying to drag drunks off bar stools and they laughed at him. And he had no idea why he was sober. He'd ruined his career. And the night before that, he just blew the biggest business deal of his entire life. And he stood in the lobby of that hotel and he didn't know what in the hell to do. And on his right was a cocktail lounge and people were in there drinking. And he could hear the glasses. And that's really, that was all that was left for him. And on his left was a church directory. And he decided to look at the church directory, find a minister to lead him to a woman who then led him to some surgeon who couldn't stay sober, and that's why we're here. Is that an accident? 
I don't think so. I don't think so. If you're new, AA is yours. And it's mine. And it's free. It's a gift from God. Thanks for having me in Lubbock. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.